Every day, we make hundreds of decisions that mark our place in the universe as individuals. Where we go to school, who we choose to date, how we decide to deal with adversity, and those who do and do not agree with our point of view all nudge us along to who we are to become. In our business lives, the collective decisions of our organizations tell a story to our customers, to our employees, and to the marketplace about who we are and what we value. How we choose to correct something that goes wrong, how steadfast we are in delivering the goods, ensuring quality, and giving people what they need indicate how much we consider the people on the other end of our decisions. What the beloved companies do is that they never lose sight of those people, and they make a choice. We heard a lot yesterday about difficult choices that have been made inside of and throughout this economic crisis. And what we're going to do as we go through the course of this afternoon, this morning, is understand some of those hard choices that have been made to make these companies to be beloved and to stay prosperous in both financial prosperity but also employee prosperity through the course of the development of their business. Now what's interesting is that the story that your customers tell each other is becoming the most important story that defines their purchase decisions. 22% of the influence we can have on customers comes from marketing, advertising, and the messaging that we create. But clearly, 78% is now owned by our customers, recommending us, but also not just saying go to them, but telling the story about how they were treated about the experience that they had. And that's what shows up on the internet. Beloved companies make five decisions that mark their place in the universe with customers. They decide to believe. By trusting customers, they get rid of the extra rules, regulations, policy, and bureaucracy that create a wedge between ourselves and our customers and get in the way of a relationship. And by deciding that customer, that employees can and will do the right thing, they get rid of managed oversight, reviewing every action, and the diminishing ability of employees to think on their feet. And that's replaced with energy, innovation, and a desire to stick around. They decide with clarity of purpose. These companies anguish over what their higher purpose is in supporting customers' lives. And in decision-making, they align to this purpose, to their promise. They decide to be real and genuine. Now that means trying to drop the corporate bureaucracy, but also creating a place where people are enabled and allowed to bring the best version of themselves to work every day. You know, we learn things that we practice in our personal lives. These organizations work hard to create congruence between the decisions we make in our personal lives and those we want to make in our business lives. They decide to be there, creating an operation from the customer's point of view versus what a lot of us have been conditioned to do over the years of working inside of our silos of building solutions from our functional point of view or what happens to be on our personal scorecards. And they decide to say sorry. There's no doubt that in any one of our businesses, there's going to come a time when we disappoint customers. How you right the wrong, take accountability, and show humility throughout that process, that experience, shows the true colors of your organization than almost any other situation they might encounter. Grace and wisdom guide the beloved companies when the chips are down, not accusations and skirting accountability. Certainly, observing the Toyota situation right now is an interesting experience at looking at humility, <laughs> apology, process, and repairing the emotional connection. You know, how many of you have brothers and sisters? Ah, me too. I have six. Catholic Italian. <laughs> 
So remember when you were young and your brother or sister punched you or pinched you? What, what happened? Your mom took that sibling and put them in front of you and said, say you're sorry. And they did. But you knew you were going to be punched another day. <laughs> That's how it feels when we receive these hollow apology letters, but it's not accomp accompanied by repairing the emotional connection. The beloved companies do this hard work, but they anguish over these decisions. And that's what creates that human bond, that emotional bond that we've been hearing about all throughout these past two days. So through the course of these next 40 minutes or so, what we're going to hear from is Zane Cycles and how they decide to believe Southwest Airlines and how they say sorry, but not only say sorry, have an engine, a reliable, deliberate process for making it happen. And USAA, how they've built their business by being there for customers, by having clarity of their higher purpose and being human in the way that they interact, by living their customers' lives, by understanding their lives. You know, you need to know and understand your customers' lives to serve their lives. And that's a common denominator of these organizations where their customers and employees grow their businesses for them. So as you listen to their stories, what I'd like to do is give you a few questions to reflect on how you're running your business today. This new book I wrote, what I really wanted to do was provide you with questions so that you could review and understand how you'd make decisions in the same type of situations. So here's a couple things to reflect on as we go through. And as we get into this, one of the things I want to just make sure we're talking about is this is about prosperity. These decisions in almost every situation, what you'll see is there is a financial impact on the collective decisions of the organization. One thing that was interesting is I did the research for the book. A funny thing happened on the way to publishing my book. There was an economic crisis. So after I had done a year of research, I had to go back and revalidate that all of these companies were still prosperous. And in fact, they were. Most of them not only stayed the same in 2008, many of them grew, proving out that these decisions prove and develop prosperity financially and with their employees who continue to grow the business for them. So what's your story? Think about the story you're telling customers, the marketplace, and your employees as you contemplate these questions. Do your customers feel trusted by your organization? Are you deliberate about sharing information and being transparent? Do employees believe that you believe in them? Do you choose to elevate, to elevate the dignity of your employees by getting rid of some of the rules and regulations? Are you managing to the minority or trusting the majority? Is there clarity that customers are an asset, not a cost center? Are decisions made by the long-term investment you need to make, starting from the beginning of the relationship through the long-term relationship that makes sure you don't nickel and dime your customers, especially as you punctuate the beginning of that relationship? Across your organization, is there clarity around what you're all collectively doing to deliver an experience to your customers that they want to have again and tell others about? Do you work together and crash those silos down to move people's jobs from executing tasks to delivering an experience? Do you choose to reinforce empathy by finding people that are passionate and then providing them with enough information, support, and development? Are you deliberate in selecting people who expose your values? Do you operate guided by industry practices? Richard, you mentioned this yesterday. Or do you decide to break from tradition by building an organization based on how customers live their lives? And are you consistent? You know, reliability is the prosperity engine of these companies. If your customer can't say in their own words what they get from you because you consistently give an experience that's repeatable and definable, then there is no story to tell. 
there is no recommendation to make. It's very difficult for a customer to say, go there, because here's what you get. And then finally, when failures occur, do you act decisively and in your customer's best interest? Do you screen every day to know what's going wrong, to connect to your customer like Southwest does, in many instances, before they even call you? So I'd like to now turn this over to uh, my friend Chris Zane, who, as uh, John mentioned, started Zane Cycles when he was 16 years old with much more sweat, sweat equity than money in his pocket. And he did what he had to do, which was to build an organization based on service and trust. So Chris, please come on up. Let's everyone welcome Chris. I'm going to run the video. Video. Oh. Is there? I'm sorry. Yeah. OK. Do you guys have a video? There was supposed to be play the video, please. There we go. There we go. When Zane Cycle started, we were small. We didn't have an opportunity to compete with our competitors, specifically on price. That attitude, you know, if it's not broken, don't fix it, we don't play to that. We're always looking to develop new processes that are better than what we've done to make it harder for our competitors to just copy what we do. I never thought it would get as big as it is. I'm Chris Zane, owner and president of Zane Cycles. Yeah, so level cranks here. I see a lot of businesses fail when they become so transaction-oriented that they don't realize that this person is a person and not just a transaction. You're not having any complaints with the feet? Numbness? Yeah. Hot spots? You get some soreness in the toes. OK. Yeah. So we looked at it and said, you know, the service that we offer and the relationship that I have with the customers is going to be more important than a couple of dollars here or there. And so we've increased our service policy. Right here. Originally, it was one year free service when my competitors offered 30 days. And then when they matched our one year free service, we went to two years free service. And then after they went to two years free service, we just knocked the bar down and said, you know, we're going to have lifetime free service on everything that we offer. We all have the same challenges of how to manage the relationship with our customers to maintain the success that we've had with our companies. The biggest companies in the world, the smallest companies in the world, still have to satisfy their customers. They still have to have a relationship with their customers. And if they become a transactional company rather than a service company, it becomes very hard to be successful. That was courtesy of my friends at American Express. They were very nice to me this year. They put me in a couple of TV commercials and highlighted me as the entrepreneur that they wanted to have represent American Express. So they created that video as well to have on their website. And it's a great introduction to the business that I'm in. So let me tell you a little bit about what we are and how we work. So we're in the bike business, but we're not really in the bike business. We're in the service business. And I would love for everybody here to have an opportunity to experience the service that we provide so that you can firsthand get an understanding of what it is that we do. So there's a little exercise I like to do because everybody knows that service costs money. I'm going to hand out some money. Help yourself. Help yourself. Help yourself. And help yourself. Oh, so nice. All right, so what am I doing? Let me explain what this bowl of quarters represents. The bowl of quarters represents the amount of money that I am willing to spend on any one customer. It seems like a lot of money. And what happens is, is that once, when you're presented with more than what seems reasonable, you self-regulate. So basically, this, if someone reached in and grabbed this whole bowl, I'd be able to go to the next customer and have them reach in and grab another whole bowl. But since the bowl is more than what's reasonable, the amount of money, in this case, about $100 is what I'm holding up. I'm willing to spend that over and over and over again on my customers to keep them coming in. I know over time that since people only take a few quarters, I've got lots of bowls lined up that I can spend to keep my customers coming back because the people who only take a little help fund the ones who need a lot. And at Zane Cycles, what we do is we provide more service than what seems reasonable. And they talk about it initially in that in that video about the, the change to lifetime free service and what we've done over the years to develop these relationships with our customers that allow them to look to us to be the solution for, for their needs. 
So let me go through some of the things that we do, and then you can get an understanding of how I'm able to be comfortable with the fact that this bowl of quarters is the reason I'm able to believe in my customers and have them, have them know or have me know that when I'm interacting with them, regardless of what the requests are, nothing is unreasonable. We start the whole process by looking at lifetime value of a customer, and we talked about yesterday's closing um, presentation. There, were, there was a discussion about non-traditional things that the companies did to keep customers. And in order to do that, they needed to look at the lifetime value of the customer and say, okay, they're worth this much to us. If we spend this much, we're going to keep them over a long period of time. Our lifetime value of a customer is $12,500. So when we say from the time the guy gets his first bike until he gets his last bike, they're going to spend $12,500 in our store. What does that mean? Well, it means that at a 45% gross margin, which is what we work off of, that's $5,625 that we're going to collect in profit from that individual. And what that allows us to do is when a customer comes into our store with a tube that they bought from us that they tried to install and they stuck a screwdriver through it, and we know they stuck a screwdriver through it because you can see the screwdriver marks in the tube. <laughs> we hand them a new tube and we apologize that we, sent, that we sold them a tube with a hole in it, wink, wink, and off he goes. Because at the end of the day, I'm not going to jeopardize $5,625 in profit on that one individual over a $6 tube, which, by the way, only cost me about a dollar. My employees, it takes time for them to understand that. And that's why we have this bowl of quarters. And that's why we have the relationship of understanding that $12,500 in revenue is what our customers are worth. Now, I've done a lot of research on this. I'm very comfortable with this number. But there's other industries that have numbers that are similar. When you look at the automobile industry, they say that every customer is worth $500,000. <clears> when they're giving you a hard time over an oil change, they are not getting it, because you're going to go somewhere else, and you're going to spend your, some percentage of that $500,000 somewhere else. So they should really embrace the relationship. Same thing with a pizza restaurant. When you look at a pizza restaurant and they mess up your order, they should give you the next one for free, because that $10 pizza is really a $25,000 relationship. And then my favorite example are my friends at Tropicana. Tropicana contracted us to supply bikes to their best customers. Same UPC code, send them in, and we'll ship you a bike. I was like, that's a $350 bike. You've got to sell a lot of orange juice to your customers to be able to support a $350 bike. And they said, well, our customers are worth $32,500 to us over the lifetime. So if we can do something that can tie them to our brand and keep them away from Minute Maid or all the other companies, we'll spend that money because we know it's a good investment. So what's your customer worth? And how can you build your, your programs and your policies to grow your businesses based on the fact that you have this lifetime value? American Express is a perfect example. I think about my relationship. I spend about a million dollars a year on my plum card. So over a 20-year period, I'm worth $20 million, which even if they make a half a percent, that works out to $100,000. They're going to make $100,000 off of me, one customer, carrying a credit card. So that's how they can spend the time and energy promoting these extraordinary activities to be able to capture the relationship with the customer over the long haul. So we're in the believe business. We want people to believe in us. We want them to trust us. So the first interaction I have with a customer in a lot of instances is when someone comes in for a bike. They want to go for a test ride. We want them to go for a test ride. If you ride a bike, by the way, with extra hard tires, because we inflate the tires in our bikes very hard, so they roll really fast, so the bike feels good when you're on it. But we send them off, and they walk up and they go, you know, do you want my keys? Do you need my license? No, no, just take it and go. Go out around the building, go down the street, go wherever you want. Just try the bike, fall in love with it. We want you to know that we're here for you long term. If we're going to start off the relationship based on trust, then what's our relationship going to be long term? What kind of message are we sending? Now, we lose about five bikes a year. Five people come in, they, t they ride off, they don't come back. <laughs> our retail business, we sell about 5,000 bikes a year. So my attitude is I don't want to mistrust or mistreat 4,995 customers because five knuckleheads think that they should steal a bike from me. It's interesting, though. It's fun when, my, when a bike gets stolen. New staff members all freaked out. Guys are hopping in their car. They're driving around the neighborhood looking for the guy on the bike. <laughs> Not to mention that the customers that are in the store are being, have been left there. They could take the store out because nobody's in the building. <laughs> so with that, I said to the employees, look, man, just let it go. By the way, they never steal the $8,000 bike. They only steal the $300 bike. So it really doesn't even cost that much for me to have that bike get stolen. When you think about the fact that we do about $15 million a year and we lose about $1,000 a year in bikes, it's a pretty small percentage. 
So anyway, customers are in our business, they're there, we want them to love us, we want them to have a long-term relationship with us. Another example, lifetime value. IBM has been promoting in magazines the fact that you know, the luggage is worth $130,000. Now, obviously, that bag's not worth $130,000, but every time I buy my Southwest airline ticket, because that's my favorite airline, I know my bag's going to get there, and they capture 100% of that $130,000 in travel budget that businesses spend over the years, instead of some of the other, not to be named, luggage losers. I don't know why they hate my bags, but Southwest certainly doesn't. Anyway. So we don't believe in nickel and diming our customers. We believe that the relationship that we have with our customers should be a long-term relationship. They come in, they need something, we hand it to them, they need a nut and a bolt, we send them on their way, we don't charge them. It's a way to buy an interaction with a customer. So we talked about the relationship that we have and it's you know, the lifetime value of a customer based on lifetime free service. We extended that to a lifetime parts warranty which our vendors supply or, or uh, support for us. And then we also have a 90-day price protection policy so that when customers come in, they say, well, you have all this great service and you have these, all these warranties, you have to be more expensive. I'm like, well, you go out, you find it for less, you let us know, we'll refund the difference within 90 days plus 10%. So there's no issue that you're going to have to challenge us. We reach in the drawer, we hand them the money if they find the product for less, and off they go, and there's never an issue of, they said they were going to do something, they don't live up to it. They want them to believe. We want our help to believe. We want our help to be embraced, embrace the relationship with our customers. So one of the most important things with our staff is that we don't hire bike people. Bike guys want to sell the bike they own. They don't want to satisfy the customer's needs. They're like, dude, I ride a Specialized. You've got to get a Specialized. It's the coolest thing in the world. No, no. The guy wants a cruiser to ride around one gear with his kids. He doesn't need anything more than that. So with that, we, we hire, and actually about five of my employees right now were customers that came into the store that we interacted with during the buying process and offered them a job because they were so much fun to be with that we're like, hey, you, we'd love to have you become part of our business. Now, we do that a lot. So the doctors and the lawyers, you know, they turn us down. But, but the people in between <laughs> jobs, they do come on. So, so what are the results? The results are, you know, we've grown 23% a year for 29 years. So we're really comfortable with double-digit growth. We have a 45% gross margin, which basically, our, my industry average is 38%. So we're 7% much more profitable than our competitors. And, we've, and we're at a $15 million in sales. And the point that I make with my employees is that the only difference between us and our competition is the service that we offer. So that way, when they're in an interaction with a customer who's handing them back that tube that has the hole in it from the screwdriver, they know that it's not about the tube, it's about the relationship and keeping that customer in our environment rather than allowing them to go somewhere else. Thank you very much, I appreciate your time. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm gonna let this video introduce our uh, next wonderful speaker, uh, Fred Taylor from Southwest Airlines. Oh, can you go back and play the tape please? Oops. Can you play that for me, please? You're watching NBC5 News at 6. Well, a lot of people may find it difficult to say, I'm sorry, but one North Texas man says it over and over and over and gets paid for doing it. NBC5's Kevin Coakley is live at Love Field, where he met with Mr. Apology himself. Kevin? Yeah, yeah. You can call him that, Jane. Every airline, of course, suffers through delays and cancellation, and most, of course, apologize to their passengers when they happen. But at Southwest, those apologies are highly personal. Well, this is a response to... Um many customers on board our flight. Call him the Chief Apology Officer or CAO for Southwest Airlines. It's one that we had a gate return uh, due to a mechanical problem. Officially the Senior Manager for Proactive Customer Service Communications. Executive Office, Fred. Or just Fred to the people at Southwest. Simply put, you didn't get the best service from us. Fred Taylor personally composes more than 240 letters a year to thousands of Southwest passengers, inconvenienced by either delays, cancellations, or other problems. And along with my sincere apologies for this disappointing air travel experience, I'd like to provide you with some additional information about what happened. We're providing our customers with a follow-up explanation that we think they deserve. Every Monday, Fred catches up on any problems over the weekend then sits down to write next to his in-office whiskey collection. We're trying to speak with them the way we would want to be spoken to 
had we been in that situation. Passengers respond with letters of their own, thanking Fred and Southwest for going the extra mile. Your costs may go up. Um, your, your bottom line may shrink, but that doesn't mean you can't treat your customers right. So everyone, please welcome Fred Taylor. It was interesting because after this uh, New York Times article hit, Fred was bombarded with everyone writing him and emailing him. And I sent you an email, and you were so kind to respond. And um, since then, we've just had a great journey finding out more and more about the operation and how Colleen and you put this together. So I thought it would be great to just share a little bit of the journey and how this came to be that you were really deliberate about not just saying sorry, but the process of engaging the entire organization around how you do this. So people dub you the chief apology officer or chief, you know, sorry officer, you know, whatever it is. Uh, tell us about how this came to happen. Well, I, I should probably say we should be having cocktails right now. But That's since right. it is 9 yeah. a.m., cheers to cheers you. Cheers to you. I, yeah, I was going to get you a bottle <laughs> of whiskey. And everyone else. <laughs> And what's up with the whiskey collection, before you answer that question, Fred? <laughs> well, you need a little something to get you through a long day. Oh, you know? <laughs> okay. So, so um, in, in 2001, um, when Colleen Barrett became the president and chief operating officer, she decided that she wanted to be more proactive, more deliberate with the way that we um, addressed our customers who have had a um, less than favorable experience on Southwest Airlines. And so she was um, looking for someone who could understand the operation, uh, would be able to work with the different operating departments and uh, who could relate to the customer's experience. And so uh, she plucked me from the front lines and invited me to take on her pet project, which was proactive communications. And uh, fast forward a little bit, in 2007, uh, Jeff Bailey wrote that wonderful article, a personal interest story about me and my job, and in which he dubbed me the chief forgiveness officer, which, by the way, is not my official title, but um, that's one he gave me. <laughs> And um, the rest is history from that point forward. So why does Southwest take saying sorry so seriously? Why is it so important? Well, we, uh, first of all, we believe it's the right thing to do, um, especially if uh, our customers have had a bad experience. And it's now part of our daily process um, in order to create a favorable impression for our customers when things don't go according to plan. So run us through the day. It starts with what we call the morning, what you call the morning, I'm me, I'm, listen to me, the morning overview meeting, or I love the way the acronym, which is the MOM meeting, right? So yeah, that's right. So walk us through that whole thing. Well, the airline industry is full of acronyms, and MOM is one of them, the morning overview meeting. And uh, the way the process works for um, my little team of five and for our company is you first, uh, you have to have a pipeline established that will deliver information, in our case, operational information to the team. And then we have a set of standards that we utilize to measure or evaluate the customer's experience or our customer's experience system-wide. And then we have a process in place that quickly gathers the facts about those experiences, determines the validity of them, and what we need to speak to, if you will. And then we start formulating our correspondence to our customers. And it's very, um, uh, it's not canned, it's unique to each customer's experience on a flight, but it always includes an acknowledgement of the situation, an apology for the experience that they've had. It uh, includes a, an invitation for them to come back and usually uh, a gesture of goodwill. And depending on the circumstances, we've also created little videos that help us, that we accompany with the electronic communication that we send out to help tell the story about uh, the situation that they were involved with. And um, our goal is to gather all this information, prepare the correspondence, and get it out the door within 28 to 48 business hours, depending on the the day that it occurred. And, and frequently it's before the customers contacted you about the incident that you're... Yeah, you're absolutely. I mean, we want to get the letter in the hand of the customer either 
uh, by their electronic device, uh, which is becoming a preferred method of communication these days, or when they get back from their trip, they have a, an actual physical letter that's written and signed by us. Uh, in their mailbox. And, and that morning meeting, it includes your meteorologists. Who else is in that meeting? Because you're really reviewing the whole day before to understand what could have disappointed customers. Yeah, right? absolutely right. We have um, all operational departments are represented in the morning overview meeting. So flight operations, in flight, dispatch, um, ground operations, uh, of course, my team as well. And we're we're collectively utilizing the information that's coming through the pipeline or that they have distributed to determine uh, what we need to be focusing on for the day. So, so what makes this work for Southwest? Why, why can't everybody do this? What, what's your secret sauce? Well, um, I can't speak specifically on behalf of other companies, but maybe it has something to do with the fact that they don't understand the value that it brings to their business. But um, for Southwest Airlines specifically, um, our company, our, our business model is founded on customer service. And as Herb Kelleher, our uh, chairman emeritus and, and one of the founders of Southwest Airlines likes to say, um, we may be an airline, but we're in the customer service mm -hmm. business. And so for years, um, his counterpart, um, the, the lady that introduced me to this uh, opportunity, Colleen Barrett, she had been working on developing a culture that is founded on um, the values and living the golden rule, mm -hmm. if you will. And I am fortunate to uh, work for a company, a corporation that uh, puts forth a lot of uh, support and resources to make sure my little team has what it needs to do the job that are, are our mission each and every day. So you've got a customer response to, to some of these outreaches for us, don't you? Yeah, I do, and um, I want to read that to you because, and by the way, um, uh, these we get lots and lots of positive feedback from the proactive communications that we deliver, and this is one uh, from a gentleman uh, who wrote to us and actually published this on his blog. So I didn't make up any of this. Um, I want to assure you, but it's, it's just that good. Um, and it's about a pressurization problem that we had during a flight um, to Birmingham that was caused by a cargo seal that came loose during the flight. And uh, the solution for the pilots at the time was to expedite the uh, descent into Birmingham. Uh, no, the mask and all that did not fall, but um, the descent was abrupt. So uh, speaking about the, the circumstances, this customer writes, as someone who flies quite a bit, I was getting less comfortable with what was going on. Uh, the plane felt like it was making a rapid descent. The captain made an announcement, and as we landed, airport rescue crews were standing by. The flight ended without issue, and Southwest staff did their usual fabulous service throughout. But the story does not end there. The next day, I received an email from Southwest Airlines Proactive Communications. It was more than a form letter. The email explained in detail and in plain English what happened on our flight. It included the facts only someone on the plane would have known, also vouchers for our troubles. I was a little surprised by the unexpected follow-up. Addressing service problems is critical to any organization's success. Quickly identifying something that didn't go well, communicating with customers, and reinforcing a commitment to quality says a lot about an organization. It's also important to be ready to respond when you're not perfect. Only then can you create devoted customers and vocal fans. And we will live by that rule Love every day. That. Love that. So let's talk about for a minute, let's wrap it up and you t tell us about what you've done, what you've been able to accomplish as a result of saying sorry. Yeah. Well, the impact of deciding to say the story, uh, we're sorry, is um, quite uh, real, if you will, and um, we, we do our best to uh, put forth this effort every day. And when you do it right, um, you create confidence, you create trust in your organization, and you create loyalty. Uh, it also stimulates business. Um, we, about 70% of the customers that we reach out and contact return to us and typically bring along with them their friends and family members. Um, the amount of gestures of goodwill that we include with our proactive correspondence 
typically generate um, net positive ROI, which means what we send out, we get back 100%, and there's, uh, we generate more on top of that. And, and last year, it was a sum of around uh, $1.7 million in rising because only 40% of our customers have uh, redeemed their, their gestures of goodwill that we sent out. And most importantly, um, we create a wow factor. We, we generate a positive storytelling experience that our customers and, in some cases, the, the media enjoy hearing. Great. Well, thank you so much, Fred. You're Let's welcome. Please give Fred another round of applause. And... <laughs> thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. We're now going to uh, turn this over to Wayne Peacock, who's going to tell the story of USAA and how they are so clear about the lives they're serving and the family members they're serving, and how they take that and have used that to really grow the business, and how they are real and, and think about their customers on a daily basis. So Wayne, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Please welcome Wayne Peacock. Thank you. Good morning. Get a little camo to get in the mood here. How's everybody doing today? Great. I'd say it's a great day to be a soldier, and that's how we start every day uh, at USAA. What I want to talk about this morning is uh, clarity of purpose, and what that means for us at USAA, it starts and it ends with USAA's mission. Uh, we start every employee meeting, our CEO talks about the mission. We start every board meeting, our CEO talks about the mission. We talk to regulators, um, we talk to our rating agencies, uh, and we talk in the same way to them that we do to our employees. We talk to frontline employees and executives in the same exact way. But that mission begins every single conversation that happens at USAA. And consequently, as we build out strategy, as we put operating plans together, and more importantly, at the tip of the spear, every single day as our employees interact with our members, Understanding the mission and acting in concert with it becomes a natural and normal behavior uh, for our company. And so it really is how we bring um, clarity of purpose. Now, there's three parts to our mission. It's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. The first one I'll call our inspiration part of the meeting, and it's uh, of the mission. It says, facilitate the financial security of our members and their families. This is a way for us to elevate what we do to a higher order than the products and the services that we sell. Recognizing some of the things Chris talked about, it's a way to get from transactions to building a lifelong relationship. And when you look around USAA and you see people with smiles on their face at work every day, it's because they are absolutely committed to helping the men and women of our military. And the sense we have is that the level of sacrifice that has been put forward by our military folks you know, is deserving of us putting our very best forward uh, to help them. And so that's the inspirational piece for us. The second piece is the what. And the what says provide a full range of highly competitive financial products and services. Now our CEO, who was the CFO before that, tells a great story back about 15 years ago talking to our then CEO about this part of the mission. And he said, you know boss, if we got rid of the word full and highly, this would actually be a pretty easy thing for us to accomplish. But with those two words in there, there is plenty of opportunity for innovation and continuous improvement every day when you come to work. But that really galvanizes us around the what that we are doing at USAA. And the last piece I will call the aspirational part of our mission. Today, we have 7.4 million members uh, who we serve really well, but a potential to serve 60 million folks who have served honorably in the past. And so an opportunity for us to take what we do well to an even greater audience is part of the aspirational charge of this mission. And if you look deep under the covers, you'll see that 80% of our members have automobile insurance with us. But on the other end of the spectrum, only about 15% have their investments with us today. So we have a huge opportunity to extend the great benefits of USAA even more deeply to our existing customers as well. And so those are the kind of the three cores of the mission that we start with and end with um, every single day. 
Now, with a mission like this, it is really important for us to have a relentless focus on our members or our customers. And we do that with a number of tactics. I'll share a couple of them with you today. This is me on an e-ticket ride, um, landing on the USS Ronald Reagan uh, last year. It's pretty exciting when you hit the deck at 135 knots, and you go from 135 to zero in 300 feet in three seconds. Um, and that was right after that uh, was taken. And that's pretty exciting. <laughs> But what was really fascinating to be out there is to spend time with the sailors and the airmen that are part of the Reagan, 5,000 of them out there. The average age, 22 years of age. The guy steering the boat the day that we were out there, 21 um, years old. And so the ability to get out and actually talk to our members who are living the life of being deployed and actually be there in a practice combat si situation is extremely powerful, which allows us as leaders to come back and tell stories throughout USAA. But it doesn't end with just the executives. Just about every weekend, there are folks from our military affairs teams who are out in grassroots um, uh, events across U the United States today talking to our members. And you'll find frontline service reps come along with them. And you'll find executives who are not frontline executives come along as well so they can get out and spend time and really understand what's going on with our membership. We also bring the military into USAA, and we do it in a number of ways, but I'll highlight a couple here of how we celebrate some of the things that are really important to our military community, whether it be Veterans Day or Memorial Day, um, the Marine Corps birthday or other types of ceremonies like that, we will put on very large productions inside the building. In fact, this photo here on the upper left is the a cappella group from the 82nd Airborne. These guys are active paratroopers, but they have awesome voices as well. Came and sang in, as part of that uh, program. All of USA's employees get a chance to see and understand what's going on. But more importantly, we then take that production and broadcast it out on USA.com and out on the Pentagon Channel so we can demonstrate to the rest of the community our commitment to celebrating what is truly special um, for our military. I'll do a quick one on the Marine Corps birthday. Uh, this is not a USAA-sponsored deal. This is what Marine Corps members do every December when it's time for their birthday. But there is the USAA employee Marine Corps birthday celebration put on by employees for Marine Corps um, veterans. And it's just you know, another great tribute to how the culture is alive inside of our, uh, inside of our company. Now, another thing we do um, and we, you know, we borrowed this from Chris Zane, is we hire our customers and embed them uh, into USAA. Almost one in five of our employees today have served, had a spouse who served, or had a family member who served. And this is a particularly interesting quote here. It's from uh, Army Ranger and Wounded Warrior and one of our current employees today, Brian Newman. Brian lost his arm in combat. But Brian's spirit and his will to continue to serve is really strong. And I think that's a great thing for all of us to know about these men and women who are in harm's way today. No matter what happens to them, their will is still strong. And what he was looking for was an outlet to continue to serve. And he saw USAA as a way that he could do that. This week in new employee orientation at USAA, you'll find 22 to 25-year-olds who are going to get on the phone and become member service reps. Uh, you'll find professionals in technology and other parts of the company. And this week, you'll also find two generals and a colonel who are going through new employee orientation right along with the frontline employees. And it's just a great testament to the power of bringing your customer base in. A great grassroots effort we're working on is called VetNet, where we've actually given a platform and some budget to folks who served. And they've created a social community inside of USAA to build a strong, powerful brand uh, with folks who have served previously. It helps them connect and make the transition from military life into corporate America. But more importantly, they're now going out to our employees who have not served and helping to bring to them some perspective about what military life is all about. So again, some great tactics that we have used um, to bring the military or our customer base alive for our company. And again, I would tell you, with a clarity of purpose and a purpose like ours, um, it is imperative that we are genuine, um, that we are authentic, or to use Gene's term, that we are, we are real. 
And we have a, a lot of stories we could tell, but the one I wanted to focus on today is really about what we do with employees on day one in new employee orientation. You know, 65 million times a year, our employees come in contact with our members, and the expectation is that they understand those members, they understand the lives that they are leading, the issues that they're facing, so they can respond with empathy. We call it going above for those who have gone beyond the call of duty. And we start on day one by actually letting them understand what it's like um, to be in the military. So we get them dressed up in a uniform, a 65-pound pack and a helmet and a flak jacket. And then we allow them to learn how to prepare meals ready to eat, MREs. Uh, and they get to partake on those on day one, just kind of a starting sense to understand the USAA culture. Now, does all of this work? Well, here's some great stats. In fact, I tell you, as we work out 2009 audited results, that 97 will be uh, much closer to 98%. What that tells you is that 2% of our members leave us in any given year. And that's all in across all of the industries that USAA is um, focused on. In the insurance business, which is where we typically have our best results, our next best competitor is nine percentage points below where USAA is. And so over a lifetime, that has a huge, huge financial benefit um, to the company, but more importantly, it helps us build lifelong relationships and truly fulfill the mission of, of facilitating their financial security. In fact, over history, 90% of, of military officers who have joined USAA and are still alive are still with us. So there's a great 2009 stat, but more importantly, a longitudinal stat that says when people come and join the USA Association, they literally stay for the balance of their lives. You know, some other great stats there on customer advocacy and customer loyalty, and I'll tell you, at the financial end in 2009, um, extremely strong results, even in the wake of a tough environment uh, economically. And USA is still today one of a handful of companies that maintains a AAA rating from S&P and Moody's and Fitch across all parts of our business. So literally less than, uh, than two handfuls of companies left in America. And so the financial results, both currently and over a period of time, follow with a strong focus on being member-centric and focusing on our customers. So those are great stats, but here's where the true power is. <laughs> right, just an anecdote. But there's a lot more that follow behind it, and I know some of my analysts at home could say we could make a trend out of this. But here's a 40-year member who responded to one of our feedback instruments and says, USAA is the best relationship next to my wife that I've ever had in my entire life. So to me, it defies logic that you could hold an insurance company or a financial services company in that level of stead, but it is a testament to the passion that is displayed every single day uh, by the 13,000 frontline reps and the 22,000 employees at USAA who are about making a difference in the lives of folks who have stepped out and defended our freedom. Now, that's a 40-year member, and that's a survey instrument that comes over a period of time. But if you go out on the blogs today into the social environment, you'll find feedback every single day. So here's one from last week. I don't have it on the slide. But it basically says, USAA rocks. I am so glad that you got your mobile banking capabilities extended to the Android platform, right? So we're getting all kinds of feedback um, every single day from our younger members who are out in a different medium who are talking to us and talking to others about us about how awesome USAA is. So key takeaways, a mission that matters, finding a way to elevate what you do in your company uh, to something greater than the products and services that you deliver. And you heard today from Southwest and from Zane talk about, you know, we're in the service business. USA has exactly the same perspective, that we are about building lifelong relationships and serving people really well. Know your customers. Uh, know them deeply and then put the, into action the information that you have found out about them in terms of new product offerings and designing and building experiences that wow them every single day. And then finally, unleash your employees. If you can create space for them to come to work every day and do a tremendous job, wonderful and amazing things will happen for them, for your customers, and for your company. So that's what I have today. But I want to maybe step back a little bit and say we, we're going to work on getting Gene out of the box, right? We saw Gene in the box earlier. And I can tell you about new employee orientation at USAA. Or Gene, would you like to come up and participate in new employee orientation? All right, come on up.
So Gene's going to get dressed up in a little uh, army outfit here. And then Chris has been back in the back somewhere preparing an MRE. And uh, hopefully <laughs> it's about time for that to be ready. So I'm we'll bring that up. Too. You're hungry? Yeah. All right. Well, let's go. Okay. All right. We have this camo for a reason. Okay. Gene gets to be to cavalry today. Oh, you, we'll get boots first. Size them. 10 for Gene. To take my shoes off. No, I'm shorter than usual. <laughs> Should have gotten a pedicure. Okay, I could work at Zappos after this. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't do that all morning. We're in, John. Okay. All right, we're going to be uh, Sergeant Lambert today from the Cavalry Division. Okay. Lombardo. Lombardo. <laughs> yes, Lombardo for. Okay, I think we've got flak jacket here, protects up to nine millimeter shells. That's great. I need that at home sometimes. <laughs> there you go. Oops. Hydration backpack. You ready? Oh, good. Need that for the flight home. All right, good deal. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Okay, we got to have a helmet. Oh, got to take care of the noggin there when you're in combat. Okay, we'll get that. <laughs> Safety first, so we got to have protective eyewear. Oh, yeah, we're good. Oh. Okay. There we go. All right, what do you guys think? All right. Okay, now we're customer centric in the DOD today, so I'm going to read this to you. This Meals Ready to Eat has been Warfighter recommended, Warfighter tested, and what Warfighter approved. So even the DOD is customer centric today. Wonderful. That's great to know. All right, I'm what are ready. we having today, Gene? We're having cheese, tortellini, vegetarian. Well, a right. nod to Italians. A nod good. to Italian for you. So let's come over here at the table, or you want to eat here? We'll come over. Well, I'm kind of a pig, so. All right. We can do it here, it's fine. Right, we'll here. do it here. So, so what, is, what is this brown thing? That brown thing is a. <laughs> that is an, an energy bar. I won't pick it up since I'll leave it for you. Okay. We do have MMs, that's, oh, that's great. Good. Crackers and cheese tortellini. Okay, so I'll try the cheese tortellini. Okay. No, I'm good. I had some last night, so. I get about a seven. Not too bad. Actually, we tested Sunday night with my 13-year-old daughters. We uh, we sat around at MREs at our house. Oh wow! They did a great job cooking. They weren't not so much on the food, but they loved cooking it. So. Right. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Very thank much. you. Thank. Let's give a hand for Wayne. I'd like to thank our. <laughs> Let's please also give a, another round of applause to our three great speakers Chris from Zanes, Brad from Southwest, and of course, Wayne from USAA. You know, we all know this love is irrational, customer love is a reward for what some consider irrational business behavior. Beloved companies get a disproportionate piece of the pie because they aren't always looking over their shoulder at what each decision will get them. So make a choice. Decide. With every product you sell, with every phone call you make, with every service you deliver, decide. What's the story you want customers and your employees to say about who you are and what you value? You can do this. The decision is yours. Thank you so very much. It was so wonderful to be with you all this morning. Please give them all a round of applause. And I, do we have time for a few questions, John? Are we OK? We're 
Yeah, sure. Uh, so the question was, uh, what is the value or, or, excuse me, what is the volume of uh, disruptions or incidents that we're looking at or evaluating each day? Well, uh, if I understood your cor question correctly, yeah, the, num the number of flights. Well, we have about 3,500 flights system-wide each day, and we have a process in place that allows us to um, evaluate each one uh, when there might be a disruption. So we have, uh, when I was talking about the information pipeline, we have a notification system that triggers us to particular incidents and then we have processes in place to quickly gather that information so we can determine the impact on our customer in real time data. We're, we're not evaluating this the next day. We're using the collective information that came in as soon as the event happened to determine what we need to do on it the next day. Uh, when we originally started, it was a discovery process, but we, we like to be very efficient as a company, so we realized that in order to be proactive, we had to get on it as soon as the incident happened. We didn't want to wait around to go through that discovery process, so that's a great question. And so uh, it's about 3,500 flights a day. Any additional questions? Other questions? Looks like we've got one right over there. We've got a mic coming to you. Um, it's for Southwest. Outside of disruptions, what's the na number one driver you have of customers being unhappy? Um, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, <laughs> typically, our customers are, are very happy with the service that we provide, but um, a lot of times uh, you'll get confusion about what processes are or information. And so to us, being consistent with our information internally so that our, all of our frontline employees can provide the same consistent message externally is one of the biggest challenges that we have as a company. And when we're talking about 3,500 flights a day, there are plenty of opportunities to get inconsistent information out there. And so for us, we have to make sure that our, our employees are armed with the proper information so they can turn around and be the advocates for us uh, in the eyes of all of our customers that are coming to us each and every day. So it is very important um, for you as a company to make sure that your frontline employees understand what is expected of them so they can turn around and be good servants to our customers that are coming through uh, or to the airport each and every day. Right over here. This question is for Christopher Zane. Um, I was just curious if you had any difficulty or if you could explain your experience um, getting your frontline associates on board with or their incentives aligned with the lifetime value of the customer? Well, I started with the bowl of quarters and showed them that even you know, when, when there's an opportunity for them to reach into the bowl, that they do it with some humanity and that they don't just grab the whole bowl. And then from that point, we explain you know, first bike, second bike, third bike, you buy a bike when you go to college, you buy a bike when you're out of college, and you explain the whole number. And we just basically laid it out so they can get a real strong feeling for it. And as it's progressed over time, our new employees shadow an existing employee for about two months. So there's a, basically there's a guy on his shoulder who learns the process and hears the banter and understands what the business is that we're in. And that just carries forward rather than having a formal training session because my employees are empowered to do whatever it takes to satisfy the customer. So over a two month period, my employees will show this shadowing employee what it is that, that he can do or what opportunities are out there. And they'll work together ultimately towards the end of his two month training 
to say, you know, how would you handle this? What should we do to make this a better experience? Because our focus is on the experience, not necessarily customer service. Customer service starts when customer experience fails. So we want to keep that customer experience positive, and we do that by having the employees empowered to do their job. I think we've got one right here. Hey, Chris. Um, just, just a question for you. What, what's your strategy in terms of opening more stores? Well, our company, we have one retail outlet, and then we do national distribution for incentive companies. If you can get a bike with points, it's going to come from us nationally. So rather than recreating multiple stores in lots of areas, we decided to go nationally through interactions with business-to-business -business relationships. We are looking at that database. We have about 500,000 people in that database now who have received bikes from us through our incentive business. And we know that Phoenix, Arizona has 660 bikes that came from our, our operation. So if we're going to open a store, Phoenix is a good, a good place to start. Same thing with Littleton, Colorado, and there's a bunch of other markets. And so we are actually you know, entertaining a retail outlet where the customer could go and continue their, or get lifetime free service on a bike that they received through a corporate program, subsequently buying them a long-term relationship starting wherever they need to be and be you know, happy with the relationship that they have with us. My question is for Jean. Oh, yes. Um, how do you deal with employee engagement, especially for non-frontline employees? How do you get them excited about customer experience? Well, one of the, do I, am I on here? I think I'm on here. One of the big things that we've been doing a lot with clients is identifying the stages of the customer experience. Your customer's having an experience with you, whether you plan for it or not. So we, we and you know where it, it loses. It's a game of telephone through a corporation, right? The executives may have a vision, and the front line knows pretty well, but it gets lost in the middle where the translation goes from person to person whose scorecard is so narrowly focused on executing a series of tasks and making sure that they're reporting on and getting done what they need to do, that they don't really think about their job as part of a sequence or a collaborative part of an organization. So a big part is, here's a question. If I walked around and asked 10 people in your company, what were the stages of your customer experience? How many answers would you get? Probably 10 different answers. So you need to define the experience collectively across your organization to be able to measure and manage the experience. So that's one of the first things we do. We bring groups of people together, front line, the middle, some top, not too top heavy, because you want to have that esprit de corps and have people feel really innovative and, and not defending. And we really identify the stages. And then we go through some really rigorous, fun processes where we identify the moments of truth or the, the connecting points, and then start to identify where the teams have to work together, because we lose our customer in the handoffs. And once that gets started, What's interesting is you can take the breakdowns you get from your detractors on Net Promoter, for example, and identify where they fall in the stages of the experience. So now you're not looking at problems as an individual silo. You know, we've talked about billing perennially. Billing isn't owned only by the billing department. It's a shared problem. So you need to create that collaborative muscle inside of the organization. So we're out of time, but I have one question I want to ask. I haven't done one yet, so I'm gonna, I have a question for Wayne. And um, I actually have a neighbor that lives down the street from me who, when I told her what I do for a living, I don't know her that well, she started to discuss, and she's not a military person. I think maybe it's her father or some other relative who's a USAA member. And she said, oh, you should get to know this company called USAA. And I don't remember the story, but it was about the call center. And when she told me what the call center rep did, it did not feel like standard operating procedure. I'm wondering, what do you do in terms of giving your call center people you know, the ability to sort of be in the moment with the, the customer and do the right thing? John, at a macro level, uh, it comes back to what I started, uh, what I talked about up front today, that uh, doing the right thing for, because it's the right thing to do, going above um, for those who have gone uh, beyond the call of duty. And that is ingrained in people irrespective of their job at USAA. And so there's this sense that you know, we have a duty and an obligation to serve those who serve. So you're going to find people making an emotional connection with the member on the other phone, end of the phone, understanding what their needs are, and then going to the ends of the earth um, to solve for them. From a process standpoint, depending on what part of the call center we're in, there are different you know, processes for latitude people have to you know, make changes or deal with um, the situation of the day. But I tell you, the real issue is right up front, um, and it's at the macro level that says, my job is to take care of your needs. And it's as simple as that.
Well, thank you, Gene, and thank you to um, all of our guest speakers from this morning. Hope you guys enjoyed the morning. Um, I talked a little bit a moment ago about Gene's book, and I don't have the clicker, but if the guys could do me a favor, I think there's a slide right after this one. So if you didn't get a copy of the book yet, I hope we have enough copies for everybody. They're, they should be out at the reg table. Um, a couple things about it. The, the book has been on Business Week bestseller list, actually, and um, was ranked among the best business books of 2009 by Ad Age and Inc. Magazine and was named Book of the Year by CEO Refresher. So it's a pretty cool book. It might be good reading for you on the plane on the way home. So um, I hope you enjoy that. Um, and then our breakouts will start at 11.15. At and then a um, quick thing about the lunch break today. It's at noon again after the first breakout session. Same location. What we'll be doing is the repeat sessions and the breakouts that I mentioned yesterday, the SAP metrics sessions, we will repeat those today. They'll be happening sort of during the ha second half of the lunch hour. So we ex extended the lunch hour, and there will be some sessions happening at 1245. So you have lunch from 12 to 1245. If you'd like to attend one of those sessions, come at 1245. Otherwise, you have a little extra time to stop by the SAP metrics lounge or to network or to check your BlackBerry. Okay? Thanks a lot, and enjoy the rest of the day.